has dedicated her life to her community and in particular to conservation. She was the first state park supervisor and oversaw many state parks over the years. She's also taught environmental education at local after school programs. She has served on the Recreation Facilities Committee, the Conservation Commission, Road Safety Committee, and co-chaired and started the Sudbury River Watershed Organization. She has also been involved with addressing the destructive Asian longhorn beetle infestation in Greater Worcester. As an active member of our community, she was the co-chair of the Southboro Animal Disaster Preparedness Committee and helped write the Animal Disaster Plan for the town, as well as serving as an assistant 4-H horse club leader. Um, Linda was also the proprietor of our first internet news source, SouthboroNews.com. Thank you, Linda. Hello, everyone. So I was asked uh, last year if I would be interested in uh, doing an Earth Day program, and I thought about it, and I said, yeah, I can do one. Uh, I didn't know I was going to be on television. <laughs> so, uh, yes. <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to go through. Earth Day um, is th April 22nd, 2015, this year, although we are in Southboro will be doing an April 25th cleanup day. Uh, this was started in 1970, and we'll go through. So Earth Day was first celebrated April 22, 1970. I was a senior in high school that year, and uh, it was a big thing to learn about the environment. And there were a lot of different little um, clubs and organizations in my high school that uh, kind of celebrated that. So that's 45 years ago this year. Um, it's created by a U.S. Senator from Wisconsin, Gaylord Nelson, and uh, he used the, his staff of like 85 people to do events and uh, conferences across the country. Um, it, it just totally started to spread from then. And he enlisted the support uh, across the board, Republicans, Democrats, businesses, uh, residents. Uh, it was poor, rich, everybody helped out. Everybody wanted to see something cleaner. So Earth Day 1970 led to uh, the United States Environmental Protection Agency called the EPA today. And uh, we've passed the Clean Air Act, the uh, Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act. And actually, I was just reading this morning that uh, the northern long-eared bat has been uh, put on the threatened species list, and the wolf has been put back onto the uh, endangered species list. So Earth Day has made it possible to move uh, the environmental concerns into the forefront of uh, politics. Uh, it's something that we all have to drink water, breathe the air. Uh, we want to live in clean neighborhoods. So there were conferences and speeches and rallies off campus. Uh, during the uh, first Earth Day. So these are a couple early posters that I was able to find on the internet. And uh, this is just all about uh, Earth Day and uh, the different posters throughout the years. I couldn't put all 45 up there, though. So we'd be here forever. So Earth Day was uh, celebrated mostly because of uh, the oil spill that happened in Santa Barbara, California. These were a few pictures. Uh, surprisingly, there's still a lot of pictures on the internet from that time. Um, so this is actually what propelled Earth Day to start and happening. So Earth Day 1990, Dennis Hayes, uh, a few, at, before 1990 it started to fade away again and then in 1990 Dennis Hayes was asked to organize the, uh, a larger Earth Day event and the Earth Day went global. So we have, uh, they mobilized over 200 million people, 141 countries and uh, the topics now really included a lot of recycling. So um, we, it was created in 1992, the United Nations Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, and 1995, President Clinton awarded the medal back to uh, the Senator Nelson that started Earth Day. And these are just a couple of pictures uh, from like even 1970 of uh, the news media. And then Earth Day 2000, we had the global warming, clean energy started to dominate the uh, field. Uh, 5,000 environmental groups participated, and now we have 184 countries across the world. Earth Day uses technology new and old. We use the internet, social media, Twitter, and everything, but they still actually use drums in uh, some African countries. So uh, Earth Day 2010, the activities were held worldwide despite political feedback about climate change. There's still a lot of pros and cons about climate change, cl uh, global warming. So uh, you probably are reading that in the news and everything. But there was a lot of feedback about the environmental movement because of that. And then Earth Day 2012 was dubbed a billion acts of green, which launched one million tree planting initiative. And uh, that is still going on, the uh, planting of the trees. 
So here in Earth Day, in Southboro, we have various groups. Uh, the Rotary is a big part of uh, pulling this all together, along with the Southboro DPW. We've had uh, Fay School, St. Mark's School. We've had uh, regular residents, kids, grown-ups, seniors. Uh, Southboro Open Land Foundation, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts. Everybody uh, helps out clean our roadways and our fields. So this is just a couple of the DPWs uh, at the command center in a couple different years, setting up where to go so that not everybody is concentrated on the same road, that the whole town gets to get cleaned up. Here's a couple of photos that I've taken while I've done the Southboro News. And this is uh, different groups that have been doing some cleanup around town. So uh, the bottom left picture is the South Barrow Open Land Foundation. And the top picture, I, I love that picture. So this year, we're on the 25th, is the uh, annual Earth Day cleanup in South Barrow. It's Saturday, April 25th, starts at 8 o'clock at the DPW. Uh, bring gloves. Um, they'll hand out the trash bags. Uh, you, you can adopt your favorite street, favorite section of town, or they can assign you a section that nobody has been working on. They have coffee and pastries and t-shirts in the beginning, and then uh, they serve pizza and uh, soda at the gazebo at uh, 11.30 this year. And the rain date's scheduled for April 26th. And that's their poster, and uh, I believe they just left the poster here for the Senior, uh, senior Citizen Center um, for this. So now I can... That was the end of that one. Uh, I was just asked real quick to see if I could fill in for the person from Algonquin that was supposed to be here. So I kind of was wondering, and I talked with Nancy about a couple of different things, and decided one of the biggest concerns in April is uh, the month for invasive species. So I figured I'd do a little bit on uh, invasive species. Um, mostly geared to Massachusetts, but it's a big concern across the world. Uh, we have global travel. We have uh, a lot of people moving around and everything. So a lot of species are coming in. We, um, I work for the USDA. I can actually work at any of the uh, ports like Miami Port or Boston if I wanted to or go out to San Diego. Um, I have a lot of friends in uh, the USDA that do do this work. And what they do is like if you tra travel to the Caribbean and you come back with some fruit, they're going to take it away from you because we don't want orange greening or anything else coming into the country. Uh, we're trying to protect our crops here in the U.S. All right, what's an invasive? Uh, a lot of us have probably seen purple loosestrife. We say that's real pretty. That's an invasive for one. So it's uh, non-native to the ecosystem, which we're considering under consideration, which if we had, say, a swamp in the middle of Southboro, we wouldn't really want to see Phragmites or purple loosestrife in there. You would rather see our native cattails in there. Uh, th we have specific wildlife to our area. They eat specific plants. You bring in a foreign plant, their wildlife um, bushes get moved out. So a lot of the swamps where you see Phragmites in uh, purple loosestrife, a lot of our animals have lost their plant uh, food of uh, cattails. What does Phragmites look like? Uh, if you go up Route 85 to uh, Hopkinton, the swamp on your right uh, as you head up to the hill to Hopkinton is all Phragmites there in the beginning. That They grow up to about 12, 14 all feet. Grasses, yes. Inside. Yeah. No, it, it may be native in other states, yeah. but not on, in the, the New England area. So, yeah, its introduction causes or is likely to cause uh, economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. Here's another thing is that I work with the Asian longhorn beetle in Worcester, Mass., and that's been costing millions of dollars to eradicate the uh, Asian longhorn beetle in the uh, states where we have found it. And it's, actually, uh, it's a major wood uh, destructive uh, beetle. Um, it actually goes after maples, and New England is considered 75% maple trees. And if you go take Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, they depend on the tourist industry for the foliage season. If you get the beetle up into those woods, uh, there wouldn't be good foliage at all. So their economic loss would be based on the maple syrup industry and the tourism industry. So this is just a, a little bit, this is what it's called. It's the framework incorporates the invasive species system approach. Uh, this is what the USDA uh, calls this. So we have prevention, which is uh, public outreach. With, uh, uh, I'll give you examples from the Asian longhorn beetle because uh, I worked there, I've been working there seven years this November. Uh, they found it in 2008 and I started in November 2008. So what we do a lot is we do public outreach. We have uh, flyers, we go to the sporting uh, events, we go to Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, we've done garden clubs, we've gone, uh, 
DPW, we've done all kinds of uh, different outreach programs. And we have compliance training where we bring in people that are going to do tree work within the regulated area. They have to come in for the training. And that's considered uh, part of the public outreach prevention too, so that they don't move the firewood that might be infested. So detection is uh, the surveys and the service calls. Um, I survey, I've been on snowshoes from the last week of January to the first week of April. Uh, even with the snow on the ground, we still have to go out and we have to look for uh, the uh, egg sites, the exit holes that the beetle may left. There's no adult beetles out right now, but they do leave marks on the trees where we know where there's an infested tree. Control and management response. Unfortunately, with the Asian longhorn beetle, if it's in your tree, we have to take that tree and that tree is uh, chopped down and chipped up into a one by one inch um, chip. So in that way, the, the lava that's in that tree cannot live its life cycle. And then restoration, rehabilitation, replanting, etc. cetera. Um, if it's in a residential area, we come in, we take your tree. That tree is then, uh, st the stump that's left is stumped out. It's ground down to like six inches below the ground. We, uh, the contractor comes in, puts the soil down, replants grass. Then one of our state foresters comes out and talks to you about what kind of tree that you want to replant. So that basically covers what would happen with all four steps here. So this is uh, really a lot of reading, but I just wanted to go over a couple things. Uh, the estimate that invasive plants already infest more than a million, 100 million acres in uh, the U.S. A uh, million acres are lost to invasive plants each year worldwide. Uh, natural habitats on public lands are being lost to invasive species at the rate of 4,600 acres a day. Uh, it contributes to the decline of 42% of our federally listed threatened and endangered species. Right now, uh, I am also, because we take trees in Worcester, they have uh, given me um, a, a duty to work with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and our other counterparts down in uh, Riverdale, Maryland, uh, about the northern long-eared uh, bat. Uh, it just got put on the threatened species list, and um, we have to go out and actually look for bat trees, uh, you know, to see if there's any viable trees within a, a cutting area that may be affected um, by that. Because of the white nose syndrome, it's killing off the bats and uh, they're trying to protect the bats now because the bats eat the mosquitoes. So in Massachusetts, state agencies spent over half a million dollars in 2001 on the control of non-indigenous aquatic plants. If you go over to Sudbury to the Wayside Grist Mill, you'll see uh, a lot of uh, aquatic nuisance weeds over there and uh, sometimes they do harvesting, other times they do hand picking, but uh, it's, it's a lot of work. And right now I believe Hawkington may be uh, looking into Lake Maspinock and uh, having some chemicals put in to uh, treat the mil uh, Eurasian milfoil. So uh, from 1906 to 1991, just 79 non-indigenous species caused documented losses of $97 billion in harmful effects. And purple loosestrife now occurs in 48 straight states and costs $45 million per year for the control and forage uh, losses. In the United States, a total of 100 million is invested annually in aquatic weed control. So of the 235 woody plants known to invade natural areas in the United States, 85% were introduced primarily for ornamental and landscape purposes. Um, a lot of the, like, I put the Phragmites grass up here. A lot of people use that in their gardens and everything, and then it gets loose. In Worcester, a lot of people use bamboo. Bamboo is on the estate's invasive species list. And I'll tell you, that's really tough to walk through. But some people's yards, it's just gone over into their neighbor's yards. The neighbors complain about it when we're on their property. We can't do anything about it. You know, we can't recommend anything to them. But it's just, it, it goes wild. <laughs> so, uh, it is pretty. <laughs> but it is very invasive. So, you know, invading non-indigenous species in the United States caused major environmental damage, public health problems, and cost the nation more than $122 billion per year. And plants are responsible for 36.6 billion of that figure. So this, I'm not going to read this off, but I can uh, make a copy of this and give it to you if you want. There's 66 uh, species in Massachusetts that are considered invasive, likely invasive, or most likely invasive. So I just kind of like put them up there, but it's, I know it's hard to read, and I know it's a long list. Uh, and I also have. Um, paperwork with the resources that I used to put this together. So if anybody wanted to take that, they could take that. And it's got MassDA, USDA, US Forest Service, and a bunch of other different places which would list these. Okay, great. So, and these are diseases of plants and trees. Uh, we have the potato wart would be 
over on this uh, right hand side. Up above that is the oak leaf, um, oak sudden death. The nematode uh, affects the potatoes. Out in uh, Oregon and Washington State, the USDA has a uh, company of people that uh, work in the fields making sure that there's no nematodes. Um, the golden nematode is one that has occurred, I believe, up in Maine here, and it makes your potatoes like non-sellable. Um, we have the chrysanthemum white rust in the center, and then we have the giant African land snail, which they have found in Florida. And that land snail, if you have uh, a cement, a stucco house, will eat your house. Can you talk a little bit about the boxwood blight? Can we talk about that? Yeah, the, the boxwood blight. Um, I think that on the very beginning uh, slide, I had a picture of what that looked like. Okay. So, um, but it's here, isn't it? It was found in, a, I think, a nursery, and it was also found in Connecticut. Okay. So, so are, but we know that the blight on it's, boxwood. Right. And a lot of, I mean, how many, I, I've got so, tons of boxwoods. I mean, they're, they're a structural, yeah. evergreen planting that's yeah. the basis of many gardens. And, it's and one of the things is, like, if you have that plant, I believe I may have a, a slide about that on how to prevent it. You get rid of that plant, you can notify somebody, they can come and inspect the rest of the plants, make sure you don't have it. Uh, they have quarantined some nurseries for uh, some, I think the uh, chrysanthemum and white rust, I think it was quarantined in a whole nursery last year. So. Just be careful where you buy your boxwoods. Yeah. Don't buy them if you don't have to now. Propagate your own. Or get yeah. it from someone you know. <laughs> <laughs> So these are just some of the invasive insects. These lists are from Massachusetts, and you can find them on the Massachusetts uh, Department of Agricultural Resources uh, list. And like I said, I have those links on a page. But we have the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, I didn't put a picture up of that because I have a couple extra slides because I work with that. Uh, the marimated stink bug is up on the top right. We have the emerald ash borer. It's this pretty green uh, insect, and it came into Massachusetts last year. And firewood statewide is now you cannot move it uh, amongst the county. You can not take it out of state. New Hampshire has uh, regulations about bringing firewood up into the campgrounds so that you can't take it into New Hampshire at all. Uh, it's very destructive to the ash trees. We'll probably lose almost all our ash trees with the emerald ash borer. So, and then we have a couple of the uh, moths. Um, and the caterpillar is a, also a moth. The, um, we have a bark beetle shown here on the bottom right. Um, light brown apple moth is the moth that's in the uh, middle. So, so there's a lot of different moths that have come in. And uh, winter moth is one. And I'm sure that everybody around uh, Thanksgiving and cri to Christmas have seen them flying around your lights, outdoor lights. or in the. Uh, I mean, sometimes I think sulfur will look like snowfall uh, just in your car lights. <laughs> Aquatic invasive plants, um, we have quite a few of them around here. If anybody goes to Lake Lake Whitehall, you'd see a lot of the Eurasian milfoil over there. Um, we have the Phragmites again, uh, the curly leaf. We have the Asian clam that's come in, and uh, a lot of the zebra mussel clam and the Asian clam. They have, uh, when they come into your waterways, they start to clog up a lot of the pipes and a lot of the uh, different, uh, they'll get on your boat and everything. So they have a screening in uh, lakes and ponds uh, for Massachusetts where they have somebody come out and they uh, screen the boats at the boat ranches, make, uh, launches, making sure that you are taking care of uh, your boat and not transporting it to a different lake. Zebra mussel is found in a lake out in, uh, around Pittsfield and it came in on a boat from New York. So we have the purple loose strife, we have uh, hydrilla, fanwort, uh, best hyacinth, swollen bladder, and yellow floating heart. Those are all on the state's aquatic uh, invasive list. Yeah, I think you have a question. Yeah. Is the last name Kalther? Kalther, C-A-L-T-H-U-S? Yeah. yeah. And actually, I took the Latin names off of here because it took up too much space on the slides. But if you go to MDAR, uh, the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources, they will list the uh, Latin names on all of these uh, species. So this is the Asian longhorn beetle. This is what I work with. Uh, it was introduced to the United States in 1996. The first place was in Chicago. And uh, it probably came in on pallets because the lava can still stay on green wood if the pallets were cut in like China because this is, they came from Asia to begin with China specifically. And the lava gets into the uh, wood if they cut, because we have so much commodity changing around the world, we use pallets and dunnage to uh, ship a lot of material in. So the pallets were probably green treated uh, poplar trees or something like that that still had the lava in it. And well, the larva can live in that. That's why when I talked about the chipping of the tree, the chip has to go to one inch by one inch uh, for the larva not to survive. But if you have a board six feet by uh, 
four inches or something, that's enough for in green lumber for the uh, beetle to live, the larva, and then emerge as an adult and move on. So it's been found in Ohio, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, Illinois. Uh, it attacks ash, birch, elm. It's mostly uh, nice trees that color in the fall. Uh, golden rain tree, hackberry, horse chestnut, katsura, London plane tree, maple, mimosa, mountain ash, poplar, and willow. Uh, active eradication programs right now are still uh, going on in Bethel, Ohio. I went and did a, what's called a TDY, temporary duty program, out in Ohio. Uh, I was out there for a, um, a month in 2011 uh, working out there. They have an infestation almost as big as Massachusetts. So um, Massachusetts, uh, we had two spots. One was a very critical area in Boston. It was found in 2010. It was right across the street at, um, from the Arnold Arboretum. It was at Faulkner Hospital. They had six infested trees. We took those six infested trees out. They've done survey in there for three years. We just declared eradication this past summer in uh, Boston. We are still working in Worcester, though. We're on our second cycle survey. Uh, we've uh, done over five million trees in the original survey. So the uh, adult beetle can lay between 30 and 90 eggs, one egg each site. It just climbs up the tree. They'll spend the same generations uh, on the tree. For, uh, the larva eats its way into the hotwood. Uh, they emerge via tunneling out. That's what makes the tree very destructive. Afterwards, it's lost its structure because it gets so many tunnels. If you just even take 45 egg sites that hatch out, then those, uh, you have some females from there. You can see how rapidly that tree would decline. So uh, the adults uh, emerge the end of June and into November. They forage on the leaves, mate, and then they start the whole recycling uh, again. So in Worcester, the facts are we're at 110 square miles uh, on the regulatory area. It includes all of Worcester, West Boylston, Boylston, Shrewsbury, and parts of Holden and Auburn. So uh, we've removed 34,600 trees. That's a lot of trees. But when you figure that we have already surveyed nearly 5 million trees in our first survey and almost a million on our second survey, that's almost a negative impact to stop this beetle. But if you were to lose all the trees on your yard, it's a major impact. If you were in the Green Deal area of Worcester, it's a major impact. If you were in the south side of Worcester or out in the western part of Worcester or you were up in uh, some area in Boyle somewhere we have not done a cut, it's not a big deal until you drive by that area that's been cut. So if anybody drives out Route 140, <coughs> From 290 going up to like Mount Wachusett, if, when you get to the reservoir, if you look on to your left, you'll see that the forest is kind of open. That was what we call a uh, all host removal. We took all, all of the maple trees out of that area. So um, we have also an additional 1,491.93 acreage removals on some of our full host removals, like what I just talked about. It's kind of hard to count each single tree and a full host, so they do it by acre. So. And uh, so we've done the 4,976,346 trees surveyed in our first cycle, which we just completed uh, December of last year. Uh, that meant that we checked every single host tree in the area that I just talked to you in that 110 square miles. And now we've started our second cycle again. And uh, as of last week, we're up to 850,368 trees surveyed. In um, the DCR lands, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, we don't replant in a lot of those properties. If we take out, if, if you had a wood lot, we would give you some trees, but it wouldn't be a tree for a tree. And then if you were a resident and you didn't even lose a tree, but you were within 500 feet of an infested tree, you get to, uh, another tree replanted if you requested it. So. Okay, so um, to back up a little bit on this is that uh, there's three different replanting programs going on in Worcester. We don't do the street trees. The city does the street trees, uh, the city forestry department. Uh, they want to um, ensure that their trees are planted in proper areas. Uh, it's the right place for the right tree is what they uh, go by. And the other is the Worcester Tree Initiative, and uh, that's um, like a public and uh, private combination. Uh, it was started by, um, I think, I believe, McGovern and um, the mayor of Worcester at that time. And uh, that they go on and they carry and they hire uh, kids during the summer to uh, water the trees and everything that they replant. And they have replanting programs and show residents how to uh, take care of the trees. And then there's our program, 
where if you're impacted by the loss of the trees, then you call us, uh, well, well, actually, we make contact with you uh, to see if you want a tree replanted. And the forester will come out and there's a whole booklet of the type of trees. We don't plant maple trees or any of our host trees. So it's like sweet gum or oak or you know something different that wouldn't be affected by the beetle. So these are just a couple of pictures of uh, the beetle here in Worcester. Um, the top right was from the mother tree. You can see all the damage to the tree that was done on that. And then uh, down below, you can see this is when we have our contractors come and take out the trees. A lot of them used the cranes. Uh, in 2008, we had 16 cranes working up there because uh, we did a major cut right in that burn coat area, uh, Green Deal. Uh, so we had 16 cranes, plus we had the ice storm that fell too. So it actually looked like some logging camp up in Maine. We had so many <laughs> logging trucks. So uh, ALB eradication program, that's a live beetle that uh, we threw on one of our t-shirts um, to take a picture of because it just had... Oh, so the white one is just the graphic. The, 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 white, white, one the white one is the graphic and the one crossing over it is the real one. Wow. So, and then uh, on the left, we have a female that's uh, digging in to um, make her egg site and then she'll lay an egg there. And then uh, over here on the bottom left, we've actually cut out one of the egg sites. It looks like a piece of rice in there, but that's the lava of the first instar. And then that from there, they're just gonna go into the hot wood of the tree. We have climbers. Uh, we've used uh, the smoke jumpers come out sometimes on temporary duty. We have our own USDA climbers and the Department of Conservation Recreation climbers. So. This is um, unfortunately on the top is Monterey Street in Worcester, what it looked like before we cut it and on the bottom is after we cut it, and everybody in their yards, uh, almost all the trees were cut, except for the ones that you can see halfway down on the right. He had an infest only sign, so all we did was take out the infest only, but most everybody else had signed on for a full host. We don't have that program that much this time unless we find a really impacted uh, neighborhood, but in the beginning, everybody that had an infested tree had the right to either take have us take all of the trees out that were host or the only the ones that were infested. And the only one on that street was the ones where the tall trees are. And this one on the left is now gone too because when the smoke jumpers came out, they found way up on the left-hand branch that there were egg sites and exit holes. So we had to finally take that one down too. But that has, uh, I should have thrown in one of um, the replanting. This has all been replanted. The trees are already about 12 to 15 feet high. And uh, a lot of the people in their backyards have uh, picked nice trees like cherries or arborvitaes or sweet gum. So they have trees there now. Uh, this is uh, also some damage up on the top right. This was at, uh, I don't know if anybody's been reading the newspaper. We uh, have taken out a lot of trees in Green Hill Park because we found an infestation there too. So if you go up 290 now into Worcester and if you looked up to the left towards the golf course uh, right across from Hanover Insurance, you'll see that's another one of our full host cuts. So. And this is just a, a crew that's surveying in the woods. Um, you know, we run into poison ivy, we run into uh, bees nests and everything else. We've run into snakes, uh, spiders. I got bit by something last year because you throw the, uh, the DBH tape around the tree and you measure every single tree. We just don't look at the tree. It has to be measured and then put into a PDA. When I put my hand around, something on the other side bit me. I have no idea what. I went to the emergency room and I said, I don't know if it's a bat or what it was. They said, well, <laughs> we don't give rabies shots out. <laughs> and I'm like, I was like panic struck for a while. So I don't know what bit me. It's still the hand, so we assume you're okay. Oh yeah, I'm fine now. <laughs> uh, this is me on snowshoes, uh, surveying last month. Um, what we do is if we find a suspicious tree, uh, what we think may have a, another, th there's a couple different options. If we find what we think might be an egg site or an exit hole, we can come out with a more high powered scope and uh, we look at that spot. Uh, we were able to dismiss this uh, tree. But um, if we still can't figure it out with the scope, then that's when the tree climbers come in and they'll climb the tree and they get right up there. What's a smoke so. jumper? A smoke jumper is uh, what you see at the fires um, out west. Uh, they come out of the plains and they jump into the fire to put it out. So and when they're not busy doing that, uh, they're looking for other jobs and a lot of times we'll hire them. <laughs> It's a good question, though, because, you know, for me, I, I, I've been in the environmental field for so many times, I just use acronyms and everything else. So, so this is uh, how to prevent uh, invasives. Uh, identify and control and eradicate invasive plant species where possible. Uh, 
So if you find something in your yard that uh, is invasive and you don't want it or you don't want it to spread, it's best to destroy it. Uh, report invasive species to um, NHESP. And I um, got what that meant. Yep, <laughs> using official field forms or to the Invasive Plant Atlas of New England. And then uh, you educate others and report anyone illegally selling, growing, or distributing uh, invasive plants. We do have Mass Department of Agriculture Resources goes to all of these big box top stores like uh, Home Depot and Lowe's, and uh, they have to check and uh, visually check those trees and put a tag on them. Plant only native species, uh, non-native species that have been uh, researched and proven to be non-aggressive in the terms of naturalizing into natural areas of minimally managed habitats. And don't move firewood. That's a big thing for us with the uh, Asian longhorn beetle. Don't move firewood. And the emerald dash borer, the same thing. The more you move firewood, the faster it can uh, move to other places. So, and uh, many species of wildlife, amphibians, birds, cannot be uh, imported into Massachusetts without proper permits. There's a, a lot of people think that you can keep some of these wild animals that they find are uh, these baby animals. Uh, it's best to leave the baby animals where they are. Um, don't bring anything. A lot of people will go up to like New Hampshire or Maine and they'll catch some kind of fish and they bring it back to the fish pond. It might not be uh, fitting for this area if it gets out into the wild. Uh, a lot of those, those walking fish, I don't think we have any yet, I hope not, but it has gotten into uh, some of the uh, lakes and ponds down around Maryland, Pennsylvania area and it's from people just releasing them. So, And then there's just some more, which uh, these links are also on that paper that I have. And that's it. So. <laughs> so if anybody wants to, has any questions, I can answer them. Uh, I do have some paperwork with the links. They're on the table over there. I also brought in cards uh, of what we look for on the beetle, and uh, it actually has the uh, size hole. Uh, so you can pick that up. And if anybody has grandkids or kids, uh, there's also tattoos of the beetle. So. <laughs> so. Temporary, Yes, they are temporary. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. Years ago, there was some kind of an uh, invasive bug that wasn't. I can't come up with the name of it. Western conifer seed bug? I think so. It, it comes on the inside of the house yeah. a lot, around the windowsills? Yeah, it was all over the list. Yeah, there's the stink bug and there's the uh, western corner for seed bug, and uh, both of them, they'll come into the house. The best thing is, all of them, don't kill them in the house. See if you can take them outside and kill them, because a lot of them will smell up the house. So you don't want to do that. Yeah, I know people that have actually ended up digging in the house and not just getting rid of it that way. Because if you caught it, they just seem to keep spreading. You know, some people will probably just want to lose it. I'm not into all that stuff. That's one thing that I've never been into. It's like a set. A lot of people, like ticks, I have had over 70, 75 uh, lime, not lime pieces, but uh, deer ticks on me at one time, walking through the woods. And uh, I've had many, they call me the tick man. <laughs> but they always say, why don't you put spray on? And I don't use the spray. I'd rather pick them off than use the uh, deep. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah. Are the stink bugs harmful in any way? No, oh. no. They just, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't really smell. They smell like pine. Yeah. I think they yeah. smell like old yeah. like yeah. yeah. pine. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Out of the yeah. pod. Yeah. I have a small pod with some in there. Just walk out and pull it. Yeah. If you can walk out room. and pull it, that's the best way. It's shallow. Yeah. 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 It only grows on one edge. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I worked at Hopkins State Park, uh, they thought that harvesting would be good for um, milfoil, Eurasian milfoil, and the purple loosestrike. And what it did is it cut it down, but the Eurasian milfoil, you can have a, even a tiny little bit and it can be dry on the shore the minute it gets wet and it comes back in, it can reroot itself. And they, um, when you, if you cut the loosestrike, a lot of the seeds will just blow away and reroot. So just try to get it early. Yeah, it before flowers. it's going to flower and see. And what about the Asian long pond beetles? Do we have those in South Carolina? No, no. Right now they are still only concentrated in uh, the Worcester, Worcester, Boylston, West Boylston, Shrewsbury, and part of Holden and Auburn. Uh -huh. 
Um, bamboo. Uh, I'm one of those lucky neighbors who, a former neighbor planted bamboo. Yep. Their yard's overgrown. Mine is starting to get infested. And is there a remedy for bamboo other than just I'm not sure. Them? You you may need best to call uh, the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources uh, and report it and see uh, if they can give you any recommendations on that. What's the best department? Yeah, um, I have paperwork over on that table, okay. and it's got links to uh, all of the places that I've talked about. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, and then you can give them a phone call. And there's a reporting uh, page on that. If you think you've seen an invasive insect pest or uh, a plant or something, you can actually report it on the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources. Yeah, I know that the people that just bought the land next door, yeah. the property next door, are trying to get rid of it. They're just cutting it down, and it keeps coming out. Yep. So you're cutting it down. No other questions? Thanks for listening to me. Thank you. <laughs> so. Thank you.